Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Cornwell, and I'm the Director of Marketing and Business Development here at Plunkett Cooney. It's my pleasure to serve as coordinator for today's program, which is part of our Sophisticated Employer Webinar Series sponsored by the firm's Labor and Employment Law Practice Group. Compensation for white-collar workers continues to be, well, a hot-button issue. Sorry, I had to do that one. Uh, for, the labor, for the Department of Labor, which is giving employers less than three months to ensure compliance with new employee classification requirements under the FLSA. Joining us today to explain the new requirements are Plunkett Cooney uh, Labor and Employment Law Practice Group members, Laura Dynan from our Petoskey, Michigan office, and Claudia Orr from our Detroit office. Uh, as always, before we get started, I'd like to take a couple of moments to provide you with some background about today's speakers and our law firm. For those of you who don't know, Plunkett Cooney is based in Southeast Michigan and is one of the Midwest's oldest and largest law firms with approximately 140 attorneys. We have seven offices in Michigan, as well as offices in Chicago, Illinois, Indianapolis, Indiana, and Columbus, Ohio. Our employment law practice group includes more than 20 attorneys who work in the areas of traditional labor law, human resources consulting, employment litigation, and workers' compensation. Our sophisticated employer webinar series is designed to help human resource professionals, risk managers, and business executives stay up to date on important legal issues and to provide HR best practices as well as to discuss trends in workforce management. Today's webinar is approved for 1.25 general recertification credit hours through the HR Certification Institute and 1.25 professional development credits through SURE. Following today's program, a certificate of completion will be emailed to each of you reflecting that credit. That usually takes a day or two, so uh, just look for that in your email. If you don't need CE credit, simply disregard the certificate. And as I mentioned, I'll introduce our speakers uh, today. We're joined by Claudia Orr and Laura Dynan. Uh, Claudia has nearly 30 years of experience representing employers ranging from Fortune 500 companies to small businesses and nonprofits. Claudia's, uh, Claudia provides a range of services in all aspects of employment law and defends her clients when litigation and administrative issues arise. She also regular, regularly serves as an arbitrator and as a mediator in employment law cases. Claudia is serving as a member of the Board of Directors of Detroit SHRM for the second time, and uh, this time as the Secretary of the organization. She also remains a member of the organization's Legal Affairs Committee. Laura Dynan has over 30 years of experience advising employers. She's built a successful practice representing public and private sector employers of all sizes throughout Northern Michigan. Laura's expertise includes traditional labor and all types of employment law matters. She's a past president and currently serves on the board of directors of the Northern Michigan Society of Human Resource Directors. And now just a couple of housekeeping notes and we'll get underway. For the Q&A portion of our webinar, we're gonna use our questions widget on your GoTo webinar navigation display. Uh, so please take a moment now to locate the widget and feel free to enter questions as they occur to you during the program. At the end of the presentation, we're going to try to answer as many questions as possible. And I always add one caveat to that. Um, so we ask you to please ask questions of a general nature. We, um, we don't want to discuss specific or ongoing issues in your workplace because that's best done privately, as we hope you would agree. And finally, I want to mention that today's session is being recorded, and that recording will be available on the event page of Plunkett Cooney's website, which is located at plunkettcooney.com. Feel free to share that link or direct your colleagues, to, colleagues who couldn't join us to that page. Thanks again for attending today's webinar. Uh, now let's get started and see what's new in employment law. Laura, I believe you're up uh, first, so take it away. Thanks, John. Um, everybody probably knows, but the Fair Labor Standards Act is the federal law that sets minimum wage, overtime, record keeping, and youth employment standards for most employers. Michigan law has a counterpart that is similar, but currently has a higher minimum wage rate. Under the Fair Labor Standards Act, unless an employee is specifically exempt, which is a term of art that we'll talk about later, employees must receive time and a half of the regular rate of pay for all hours worked in excess of 40 in a work week. You can't combine work weeks to um, get 80 in a two week period, it has to be 40 in a seven day work week. 
There's a few exceptions if you're a public employer for um, firefighters and police, and there are also exceptions for hospitals, but most employers don't qualify to use an 80-hour to two work week period. The largest category of exempt employees under the Fair Labor Standards Act are what are called white collar exemptions. And essentially these are certain executive, administrative, professional positions, and also outside salespersons and some IT professionals fall under this. That wouldn't be your helpline people, but uh, software and hardware designers can um, sometimes qualify for the IT exemption. Generally, an employee falls within the white collar exemptions only if three criteria are satisfied, and it has to be all three. First of all, they have to be paid on a salary basis, um, which is a term of art under the Fair Labor Standards Act, which um, we'll also explain. Some cases, certain professionals like attorneys um, can be paid on a fee basis but primarily they have to be paid a regular salary week in, week out. And that salary has to meet a minimum level. And that's what we're bringing to your attention today. That was just changed by the Department of Labor. The minimum salary level jumped. And third, they have to meet the duties test to be exempt. And there are um, specific guidances in the Department of Labor regulations that help you go, go through and determine if they meet the duties test. And Claudia has an awesome chart attached, or I think it's been uploaded to the materials that she'll explain a little bit to you right now. Thank you, Laura. Um, if everyone downloaded the chart that, that was attached um, to the webinar um, waiting room or introduction, um, you'll see if you scroll for example, to the second page, it says the executive exemption. And the way this chart works, I'm just going to explain how to interpret the chart and then you can use it on your own, is that the actual test for an exemption is going to be on the left. And then on the right are the explanations, the definitions, the examples, the tips, and so on. So for example, the test for executive exemption will, will take take up several pages that, as you scroll through it. And um, the first part of the test is that the compensation be paid on a salary basis at the rate of not less than $684 a week, exclusive of board lodging or other facilities. And so you might say, well, what does that mean, exclusive of board lodging or other facilities? And so, the um, explanation for that is on the right. And again, for the executive exemption, you have to scroll several pages down to get the entire actual test on the left. So you'll see part A and part B are on page two. And you keep scrolling down, there's more tips, more explanation. Part C and D are actually on page four. So the test is always on the left. And if you're concerned about what does that mean, the explanations are on the right. So that's how you use the chart. Laura, back to you. Thanks, Claudia. So the Fair Labor Standards Act was passed in approximately 1932 during the Depression, and there were minimal, if any, changes for many decades. And over the last 20 or so years, there have been a couple changes, but the salary levels in the act um, are pretty out of tune with what the economy is like today. So in March of 2014, President Obama signed a presidential memorandum directing the Department of Labor to update the regulations and in particular look at the salary basis. He didn't think it was right that people who only earned about approximately $23,000 a year were not entitled to overtime. So in June of 2015, the Department of Labor issued the proposed rule. And at that time, they proposed that the salary basis be increased to from $455 a week up to $970 a week or $50,440 annually. And 
once the Department of Labor issues a proposed rule, it goes out for comment. They're required to read every comment, so it delays implementation. In March of 2016, the Department of Labor submitted the final rule, and after listening to the comments, instead of doing a fixed threshold, they tied it to wage rates that would change over time, and it was a pretty complicated scale. On May 18th, 2016, that final rule was published. It set a new standard salary level, or the salary basis, to be based on 40, the 40th percentile of full-time salaried workers in the lowest income census region, which currently and usually is the South. That's where the lowest paid employees generally are. It set a new highly compensated employee exemption, based on the 90th percentile of full-time non-hourly workers nationally. But the court struck down these 2016 regulations. So we have a chart here showing the previous standard salary in um, 2014 was $455 a week for an annual salary of $23,660. And if you used the highly compensated employee figure, the annual threshold was $100,000. The 2016 standard salary proposed was $913 a week for an annual salary of $47,476. Or if you use the highly compensated employee annual threshold, it was went from $100,000 to $134,000 a year. Claudia? All right. Um, so here's another way of, of looking at uh, what is happening. Um, the 216, in 2016, what the amount was compared to 2019, you can see that basically between the 2016 Obama regulations and the current regulations that they basically split the difference between what what had been passed in 2004, which was $455 a week. They kind of split the difference between that and the 913 came up with 684, almost smack dab in the middle. Um, and then again, you can see how they changed it from uh, um, President Obama's um, era, 134000 and changed down to $107,000. Next slide. Here's a, uh, another way of um, looking at the progression of the increases from 2004, which is 455, to 2016, 9, and 13, down to 684. And there are exceptions, by the way, for employees that work in some of our territories, unless they're working for the uh, U.S. government there. And again, on the right, you can see the difference. <clears throat> um, it, it actually should be 107,432, not um, 10,042. I don't know how that typo got in there. Um, but you can see how it, it's changed up. Next slide. So how does that break down if you're paying them on a weekly or bi-weekly or whatever basis? Um, so these are the equivalent amounts for the new salary thresholds. And you gotta pay them at least 684 a week or 1368 if it's every two weeks. If it's monthly, which is a little bit different to calculate, it's 1482. And if it's monthly, it's 2964. But by the way, the shortest period that you can use for an for a salaried employee is a one week period. Next. The the test for the highly compensated employee really hasn't changed. Uh, the employee must customarily and regularly perform any one or more of the exemption duties, not all of them for an exemption. Um, but again, this is increasing the um, threshold for a highly compensated employee from 100,000 to 107,432 dollars. Um, incidentally, you're, you can do this over a 12 month period. And so if you're looking at, you know, your fiscal year started October 1, for example, how do you figure out how much you have to increase them to, to pay them correctly under this test? 
So if the annual co period covers both before and after January 1, which is when the new regulations take effect, the total comp required the first year is determined on a proportional basis. So if half the year you use is before January 1, then the employee must earn 50,000 or half of the original 100,000 that was required for those first six months. And then after January 1, for the next six months, they have to earn half of the 107,432, which comes to 53,716. So that's how you do it. But that's, again, just for this first transitional year. Next slide. So the way the compensation works for the highly compensation compensated employees, you have to guarantee them at least $684 a week in salary or on a fee basis. And then the rest can be made up in bonuses or commissions to help motivate the employee. So that's a whopping $71,864 that while you have to guarantee it, it's a lot of motivation. Um, so that's how the uh, new test works for the highly compensated employee. Next slide. But if at the end of the year, the employee has not earned the full $107,432 based on that 684 a week plus the bonuses or, or commissions that you're paying them, you still gotta make it up. So I don't know how much motivation they are when they could sit on their thumbs and, and wait until the end of the year knowing you're gonna have to make up the difference. Um, you actually, um, if you don't make up the difference, then the problem is um, you could lose the highly compensated employee exemption. Now, that doesn't mean that another exemption might not apply, but remember, you have to look at the duties test, and for the highly compensated employee, you only have to perform one of the duties of whatever exemption you, you think they qualify in or any of the exempt employees. But for a particular exemption, there's a bunch of tests involved in in how this person has to apply. So, you know, employers are going to be motivated to make up the difference unless they think that this employee will fit into neatly into another exemption in their duties test. Um, you actually have one extra, one final payment that you can make at the end of that 52-week period, and you got to do it within a month or you'll lose the exemption. So next slide. Um, so looking at it again, um, for high high level computer employees, and again, these are like the systems analysts, the ones that are um, actually creating the um, programs and so on. These aren't help desks. These aren't the ones who just install your equipment or anything like that. Um, but if they're high level duties, um, in 2004, the test was $455 a week or $27.63 an hour. In 2019, the weekly amount is, has um, risen, but it's still the $27.63 an hour um, to qualify for the high-level computer employees test. New, the, um, thanks, Claudia. The new Sorry. regulations allow non-discretionary bonuses, incentive payments, and commissions to satisfy up to 10% of the new standard salary level. So up to $68.40 of the $684 can be um, attributed to a bonus, an incentive payment, or a commission. The non-discretionary payments have to be made on an annual or a more frequent basis. So the employer has to designate any 52-week period. It can be a calendar year, a fiscal year, or an employee anniversary year um, to calculate your um, non-discretionary payment window. And if you don't designate anything, the Department of Labor will use the calendar year. This rule doesn't apply to highly compensated employees. It applies to those that are going to be paid on a salary basis. So if at the end of the 52-week period, the sum of their weekly salary plus their non-discretionary payments do not equal 52 times 684 or $35,568 a year, 
the employer has to make an additional payment to satisfy this amount. So you could pay them um, less than six, 10 percent less than six hundred and eighty four dollars a week and tell them they have to make up the difference in commission. Um, they don't sell enough to earn thirty five thousand five hundred and sixty eight dollars per year. If you want that person to be exempt, then you have to pay them one additional payment to make up the gap. However, how, how, excuse me, how much below 35, so say they make $30,000 that year instead of the 35,568. If you wanted to keep them exempt, you would have to make up the difference and pay them the $5,000 extra in one payment within, um, flip the slide, that payment has to be made no later than the next pay period after the end of the 52-week period you designated. So if it's the calendar year, you have to make it up the first pay period in January. If it's the anniversary, the first pay period after their anniversary date, et cetera. And so this extra catch-up payment counts toward the prior year's salary and not the salary amount for the year it was paid when you're calculating the salary basis for exemption purposes, but it would go on the W-2 of the year in which the money was actually paid. So the easiest way to talk about it, I think, is to use the calendar year. So you make a catch-up payment. Somebody is shy $1,000 for the salary basis test for the calendar year. 2019. You make that payment in January for determining whether they were paid on a salary basis. That thousand dollar payment goes on top of what they did earn in 2019, but it would go on their W 2 for the year 2020 because that's the year it was actually paid. So hopefully that makes sense to you. Um, if an employee doesn't work the full year, they only have to be paid a pro rata portion of the minimum amount. So Next they'd have slide. to get the. If they don't work the full year, they get a pro rata portion of the minimum. So you could pay them six hundred and eighty-four dollars. Um, for all the weeks they worked, but if they don't work a whole year, they don't have to make the 35,568, and they could, on the salary basis, still be properly classified as exempt if they met the duties test. I think we already talked about the employer has to make the extra payment within one period after the end of employment. Claudia? Okay, so, um there's a new thing that they have called the minimum guarantee plus extras. So lately I've had a lot of clients who employ RNs and they there's a shortage of RNs and they're wanting to provide additional compensation to encourage the nurses to work more than their 40 hours. Um, and it's been a little tricky, you know, to come up with a motivating bonus not tied directly to hours, fearful of losing the salary basis um, payment schedule. So the new regulations say that you can actually pay exempt employees additional compensation without violating the salary basis, which is really cool um, because you don't want to jeopardize the exempt status. So starting January 1, an employer can pay exempt employees the $684 a week in salary and pay them additional amounts to motivate them such as commissions on sales, percentage of profits, next slide, or additional compensation for extra hours worked beyond the normal work week. This added compensation can be at either at straight time, the hourly rate that, that their salary would break down to, or at time and a half the hourly rate, um, which prior to these new regulations would have given me more gray hair to have a client paying a salaried employee 
at time and a half or hours worked over 40 in a work week, that, that just would have been a big problem. Um, it can also be now a flat sum, a bonus, um, or any other amount you want. Um, another choice is to um, actually provide the employee with additional paid time off if you want. Um, but this would only help if the employee employer if the if the employer only needed the added hours from the worker on a temporary basis if you need them to work extra hours on a regular basis giving them extra time off just doesn't really make any sense next slide so here's an example uh if you have an exempt employee who's paid let's say a thousand bucks a week and generally that employee works 40 hours um let's say they're in retail and during December, the employee needs to work 60 hours a week, the employer can actually reward the employee with extra pay or as we discussed, grant them extra time off come January. Next slide. Um, also, the manner in which the exempt employee can be paid has, has expanded under the new regulations. And so instead of a weekly salary, exempt employees may be compensated on an hourly, daily, or shift basis without affecting their exempt status. That's, that's a kind of um, a huge shift in, in how you have to pay your salaried employees. But for this arrangement to be permissible, you have to have a guaranteed minimum weekly requirement of $684, regardless of the number of hours, days, or shifts that the employee actually works because you've got to satisfy that minimum threshold. And there must be a reasonable relationship between whatever guaranteed amount there is and the amount that the employee actually ends up earning. So let's look at an example of how this means, what this means. Um, the reasonable relationship test will be met if the weekly guarantee is pretty much roughly equivalent to the employee's usual earnings at the assigned hourly, daily, or shift rate um, for the employee's normal work schedule. Um, maybe some examples will be helpful. So let's say the employee is guaranteed at least $725 a week for any week in which he performs work. That's the guarantee. And let's say he normally works four to five shifts a week. That means he may be paid about $210 a shift without violating the $684 a week minimum salary threshold requirement. So if he works four shifts, he will make $840. If he works five shifts, you're going to pay him $1,050 um, because you're paying him $210 a shift. And the more shifts the person picks up, the more um, they're going to earn. Um, and this $1,050 is not that much more than the original $750 or $210 a shift that you're guaranteeing. So um, that has a reasonable relationship. Next slide. However, if the employee is guaranteed the 725 a week and is also paid 1% of all sales or 5% of all profits, which in some weeks could end up being as much or more than his guaranteed salary, then the employee can't be paid on an hourly, daily, or shift rate because it would jeopardize the, ex the exemption because there's no reasonable relationship between the weekly guarantee of 725 a week and his usual earnings, um, which could be as much or again or more. Here's what I think is going to happen. Um, I think this is going to create issues for employers because how much is too much before there's no reasonable relationship? I mean, these are examples that are provided by the regulations, but there's a whole lot of gray area in between there. And it's going to be pretty tough for employers to say, well, we're getting closer to the one example than the other. Are we getting too close to it? Have we lost the reasonable relationship? So, you know, there's going to be a lot of gray area. And I guess it depends on how much risk the employer wants to take. Laura? Sorry. The administrative and professional exemptions are the only ones that permit payment on a fee basis. The test to determine whether the amount of the fee satisfies a minimum salary level is based on the amount of time it takes to accomplish the work and whether that fee rate would be adequate if the work took 40 hours. So the 
example in the regulations is that an artist was paid $350 for a picture that took 20 hours to complete because the artist would make $700 if it had taken 40 hours it would satisfy the current $684 requirement. But if the artist was only paid $300 for the picture that took 20 hours to complete, the artist would only make $600 if it had taken 40 hours, and that, that would not satisfy the current $684 requirement. So mark your calendars. This takes effect January 1st, 2020, which will be here before we know it. Um, what, what should you be, next slide please, what should you be doing right now? You need to conduct an internal wage and hour audit. You need to identify those employees whose status could be affected by the proposed salary threshold. People that you are currently treating as exempt that don't, uh, excuse me, don't make at least $684 or $35,000 a year. So they make more than the current salary threshold of $23,000 a year, but they're not going to meet the new level. So you need to identify who those employees are, and then you need to analyze their job duties um, if they're under or on the borderline of that threshold. Um, it The best safest method is to take those employees that flirt with that um, salary basis level and or the duties and classify them as non-exempt because the um, Department of Labor won't even look twice at anybody, um, I, I shouldn't say it like that. They prefer employees to be classified as non-exempt. They want to see everybody getting overtime that can pass, they can possibly force into that basket. They view exemptions as suspect. Their job is to look out for the employees. And so if somebody is on the fence of whether they'll qualify on an annual basis, the safest route to take is to classify them as non-exempt. If that's not attractive due to their job duties, your company, their role, whatever it is, then you're going to need to bump their salaries so they clear that $684 a week and $35,000 um, and change a year. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, you should also, right now, being looking at and assessing the impact of reclassification on employees. Look at benefits eligibility for exempt versus non-exempt employees. That's going to be a factor in changing status of people. A lot of places have different benefits for their exempt employees. And can, um, you know, this is a, it's an opportunity for employers to correct mistakes that have been made in the past, but you are going to have to frame it and sell it. People who have always been treated as exempt and can come and go and feel like they've given their all to their position, a lot of those people will feel like this is a demotion to be classified as non-exempt, even if it means they might make more money. So things that are going to require you to sell it um, are considering the benefit effect, if you have different benefits for exempt versus non-exempt employees, um, you're going to have to look at coming up with a new compensation plan, taking into account the potential for these employees who are reclassified to start earning overtime pay. You may need to redesign your job descriptions, um, your staffing policies, your wage and hour policies, and you're going to have to train your previously exempt employees on timekeeping procedures to ensure their compliance. That's also going to be a difficult thing for people to start doing if they, again, never had to track their time. So um, now is the time to act. You really have a very short window. Claudia? Okay. So uh, when you're taking an exempt employee and making them non-exempt, um, how do you come up with their new hourly wage rate? 
well, there's there's a few things you can do. First of all, maybe instead of making them non-exempt, or just raise their salary rate so that it now complies with the new threshold, and you'll you'll be able to satisfy it. Um, after all, it's it's only an extra two hundred thirty dollars a week or so that you'll have to pay them. No impact on the budget there. Um, but if you're going to actually make them non-exempt. Um, you could actually still, now that they're hourly employee, you could still pay them on a salary basis so that the employee re remains happy because they're still getting a salary, um, but require them to track their time and pay them time and a half for all overtime that's worked. This actually increases the cost of the payroll the most and is the worst deal for employers because you're, you're still guaranteeing them a minimum salary a week no matter how few hours they work but now in addition to that you get the pleasure of paying time and a half um, next slide or the employer could pay the employees at a comparable hourly rate that would take into consider the amount of overtime that's going to be required of the position so if you calculate it correctly um, you'll maintain your current payroll and the number of hours work that you get out of the employee it's the least amount of change for everyone so, for example, if the employee gets paid 475 a week and has to work 45 hours a week to earn that, um, that's the same as actually paying them for 47 and a half hours because that last five hours of the week, um, they're getting paid time and a half. So those five hours are like seven and a half hours pay. Um, so that equates back to $10 an hour. Um, this calculates in the overtime you expect to pay each week for the extra five hours of work. So that's actually 47 and a half hours a week that you're paying them for. And, you know, when you do the math, it's 10 bucks. So they, they work the same number of hours. You get the same amount of work out of them. They take home the same pay. Everybody's happy, right? Um, or the employer can pay a comparable hourly rate, but prohibit overtime. So you would divide in. 40 hours a full-time employee to the 4.75. Now you're at $11.87 and a half cents an hour. Um, so they're actually earning more per hour, and your payroll will only stay the same if you make the employer employees not work overtime. But now instead of getting 45 hours worth of work out of the employee, you're only getting 40 hours. So that's not quite as good of a deal for the employer. Um, next slide. Or you can, um, because of, of the new features, an employer can now pay a salary plus extras um, and implement a non-discretionary bonus program. Um, bonuses are typically better than um, commissions for a variety of reasons under Michigan law that I don't have time to go into, but it's my preference to have bonuses instead of commissions especially if it involves any kind of um, sale of, um, of, of products. Um, but to offset the higher payrolls, the company could actually um, maybe lower its contributions to benefit plans, like the co-pays for health insurance, and increase the employee contributions on the premiums. That, that could help offset the payroll if, if this change is going to make things tight. Or you can eliminate discretionary benefits such as the short-term disability, long-term disability, dental, stuff like that to offset the extra payroll. By the way, there was just something that came out about bonuses. I don't know if you folks know this, but um, if you pay a, a bonus, if you announce a bonus at the beginning of the year and you pay it at the end of the year, and it has to do with, you know, like you're motivating the employees to work harder, make more profit for the company, and so on. Whatever you pay the employee, you've got to take it and, and attribute it to each week during the year. So if you're paying them $5,200, that means that the employee actually earned an extra 100 bucks a week. And if they worked any overtime, you now have to take that $100 a week into consideration for what their regular rate of pay is and pay them additional overtime pay for that bonus as well. There's a proposal by the Department of Labor that would change this up so, somewhat if it, if it actually goes through. I don't know that it will, but they are considering changing it up um, uh, in a limited way. Um, 
So uh, next slide. Another way to um, cut the added costs is to make lunches unpaid if you've been paying them in the past, or you consider um, alternate payment plans for the exempt employees, like paying them by the shift, the hour, day rate. That way, if they're not working, you know, five shifts in a week like they're supposed to, instead they're only working four, you, you actually aren't going to be paying them as much. Uh, next slide. Um, and of course, you need to formalize necessary reclassifications by making sure the job descriptions and titles are correct in the file, make sure all individuals in specific positions are classified correctly, review the duties, fix any screw up that you made in the past and re correctly classify employees, communicate the changes to the employees, have them sign the new job descriptions, and follow up with employees, especially those who um, weren't used to punching in and out, make sure that they're doing things correctly. Next slide. But the inevitable result is that typically companies are going to have more non-exempt or hourly employees, which means that there's going to be more overtime. Next slide. Perfect. Op this is the perfect opportunity to pass inadvertent misclassifications. As Laura was saying earlier, um, you have to be concerned when you change an exempt employee to non-exempt and selling it correctly, or the employee's um, nose will get out of joint. They'll think they've been demoted. They won't be happy. But here you can blame it on a change in the law. You had no choice. You had to make them non-exempt. And so you can kind of um, hide some of the, the sins of the past um, and hopefully fix it without the employee becoming wise at all along. They should have been getting time and a half for all hours actually worked over 40 in a work week. Um, this will allow employers to consider whether classifications are accurate and, and in light of potential changes to the job duties and descriptions. So what's happening with the Michigan Paid Medical Leave Act? I know you all sat through this line to know what's happening. Uh, the Supreme Court hasn't ruled yet. We don't know. Um, but just to give you a little bit of um, background, um, if you recall, there were two citizens initiatives that were supposed to be on last November's ballot. One would have provided 40 hours of paid sick time to employees who work for smaller employers, you know, those who have um, fewer than 10 workers, and it would have required 72 hours of paid sick time to employees who work for employers having 10 or more employees. And um, the other initiative would have increased the minimum wage rate to two, to um, 10 bucks an hour with with yearly increases, um, bringing the minimum wage rate to 12 bucks an hour by 2022. Um, and it would have also phased out the tip credit for restaurants. What you know that they um, need to supplement the the employees' reduced wages based on tips. So if this had been left on the ballot last November and had been passed by the citizens, um, it would have required a three-quarters vote of all members of both chambers of the state legislature rather than a simple majority to change it up. So what happened was after the no, um, before the November election came, the state legislature adopted both laws, and then after the election, they amended both of them, and Governor Snyder signed it in the lame duck session, and now we have the amended versions in law, and that's the rub for the Supreme Court. Um, the amendment significantly watered down the benefits to employees, making both laws far more friendlier to the employers. Um, the way it's set up now, instead of 12 bucks an hour by uh, 2022, employees aren't going to make 12 bucks an hour until 2030. So you see how much more favorable it is to the employers with what was done during the lame duck session. So right after the first of the year, you get new legislators adopted and they're, they're um, in session. And the Democrats in the state legislature asked the new Democrat uh, attorney general to opine if the so-called adopt and amend process is constitution, uh, constitutional under our state legis our state constitution, because remember, this was a, val a ballot initiative, a citizens initiative, and the idea being instead of having three quarters of a vote of both chambers um, change it, 
Instead, by the way they did it, adopt and then amend, they did it by a simple vote. And so the Democrats aren't happy. The Republicans turned around and made the same request to the Michigan Supreme Court, apparently believing that there's a conservative majority that would provide a far more pro-employer opinion. So the Michigan Supreme Court agreed to hold oral arguments on the issue, um, but it didn't commit to actually issuing an, an advisory opinion. So July 17th over the summer, there was a hearing that lasted about two hours. And you can tell from the questions being asked that they were, most of the justices were very troubled by the process of adopt and amend. Um, you could also tell that they weren't convinced that the court should issue an advisory opinion, so, or even one by a specific date. So we really don't know if we're getting one. Um, we all kind of thought that we would have an opinion by now because, um, you know, they, after all, they did this on their summer vacation time. They had these oral arguments. So it was like there's a rush to hear this. You would think they would have rushed out the opinion. Um, Justice, the Chief Justice Mc, uh, McCormick focused on the timing of the legislators' amendment, asking, for example, what if they had waited until January of this year to amend it and rather doing it during the lame duck session? Would that have made it permissible? Um, what if they all they were doing were just correcting citations in the adopted initiative as opposed to a substantive change? Um, is it the issue of, of the timing or is it, um, you know, kind of thwarting the will of the people that's the issue? Um, and what should the remedy be? I mean, that's kind of a huge issue. Do they um, say it, it, the citizen's initiative is what should become law at this point, raising everybody's wages up and instead of the 40 hours of paid medical leave act time under Michigan law now, instead it's going to be um, 72 hours for any employee over that works for an employer of 10 or more employees. Um, I mean, is, is that what should happen? Should the original voter initiative become law? Or, I mean, the, it, the citizens' intent was basically to put it in front of the voters. Maybe what they should be doing is just saying, live with this for now, and it's got to go back on the ballot. So you can tell by the questions that they're asking, you know, at the time, they none of them were really sure what they should do with this hot mess. Um, so, you know, should, were the, was the paid medical leave act and minimum wage rate constitutionally enacted or not? And if so, if it, if it wasn't, what's the remedy? Um, we just don't know what they're going to do at this point or if they're even going to rule. Uh, my suspicion is, is that you've got a majority person that one of the justices will be assigned to write the majority opinion. And I bet there's going to be a strong dissent written, regardless of which way it goes. And so there's someone that's going to be appointed of the judges who dissent who are going to write that opinion. And then within each of their um, their blocks of support, they have to circulate whatever opinion they write and try to get a consensus on the wording before you put the two together and, and issue the opinion. Um, but we thought we would have it by now. And we thought we'd have some better interesting t things to tell you about with the Paid Medical Leave Act and what its status is. But right now, we're just on hold. That's where we're at. And we don't know what's going to happen. But um, if you're not signed up to the sophisticated employer blog, um, go to our website and sign up for it. There will certainly be an article announcing what happened. Um, it, it, if you're signed up for our events, our seminars and webinars, and then um, you'll, you're probably also on our um, rapid reports mailing list, and we would get it out to you that way as well. Um, but as soon as something's decided, we're going to let everybody know. You can be sure of that. I, thanks, Claudia. I have one more um, thing that I just want to alert everyone to. Last week, Governor Whitmer put out a press release indicating that she's directed the state um, wage and hour division, I think, oh, Department of Labor, um, to put together a rule increasing Michigan's 
um, right, increasing the salary threshold for employees in Michigan to earn overtime. She, I believe it's around 50,000. She is, uh, um, references the changes that President Obama proposed and her um, instruction as to coming up with a new rule is to raise it high enough, high enough excuse me, that an additional 200,000 Michigan workers would be entitled to overtime under state law. So she, she doesn't feel that 35,000 that the feds just put in place is enough. She's instructed the state to raise Michigan's threshold. And I think I, I haven't, I don't have the exact number in front of me, but I think it's in the $50,000 range. So more to come on that. It'll probably take at least six months to a year once a rule is actually proposed for it to ride its way through the legislature. And with the current legislature, it probably won't go anywhere, but that's out there um, floating around also. Okay, thanks very much, Claudia and Laura. Um, actually, one of the questions I saw in the queue had it dealt with the Michigan uh, issue with uh, Governor Whitmer, so I think you kind of covered it. Um, but now is the time for Q&A, uh, so thanks to everybody who has already submitted a question. And as a reminder, if you can or would like to, go to your uh, questions window on the uh, GoToWebinar widget and uh, answer a question now. There are a couple here for us to take a look at, so uh, hopefully you can uh, log your questions uh, before we wrap up for the day. Uh, the one question that I see here is as follows. Does the minimum guarantee plus extras, and in parentheses specifically the straight time hourly rate, in effect now or only January 1st? And uh, does the reasonable relationship test still apply? I'm not sure what was what was the question again. It's not making sense to me. Okay, so let me try it again. Does the minimum guarantee plus extras uh, now in effect now or only uh, after January 1st? And does the reasonable relationships test still apply? Um, the reasonable relationships test will apply um, at all times for this change. Um, when the 2006 regulations were struck there's some question whether it was just the threshold level that was struck or whether or not the regulations were struck in their entirety and so whether or not the guaranteed plus extras survive that um, is somewhat debatable if you look at all the court opinions um, I wouldn't lose any sleep over it um, if you've been doing that and it was struck certainly there's I don't think there's a problem, a huge problem with that. Um, but come January 1, it's going to be in effect for sure. So, um, and that's when the reasonable relationship test also is becomes key. Okay, there's an, uh, one other question at this point, um, and oh, there's more popping in here. So I think at least one more after this one. Uh, for extra time off for minimum guarantee plus extras, is this something that's similar to comp time? No, comp time actually applies, is a concept that applies for um, hourly employees, like instead of paying them time and a half, instead you give them um, comp time off where they get paid for their time off. Um, it's it's limited. Um, you still have to worry about federal regulations, which, which don't permit that for the most part, except in rare exceptions. Um, state law allows it but you usually come under the federal regulations if you're engaged in commerce and do enough business. So it's, it's, it has nothing to do with comp time off. You can just let salaried employees <laughs> work one hour a week and pay them their whole salary if you want to. Um, the, the issue of giving them additional paid time off usually has more to do with accountability issues. So if you have like a PTO plan that gives them 40 hours a year that they can use and they're coming in late or leaving early, you can still make them use up the time in their PTO bank so that there's there's some accountability. 
Now, later on, after the time's gone, you may still end up having to pay them for the time, but they've used up their time off in a in a program. Um, and so it's it, that has to do more with accountability. Um, for um, salaried employees, um, if you have like sick banks and they burn through all their sick time, you can start deducting full days from their paycheck. If they take a full day off and they're out of sick time and they took it off because they're sick, you could deduct from their, their salary a full day, not half day or anything like that. Same thing with vacation time. If they take time off for personal reasons and they miss a full day, you can deduct a full day from their salary if they take a full day off for personal reasons and they're out of their vacation time. Uh, if they take a day and a half off, you could only only deduct the full day. You can't make any partial day deductions for anything from a salaried employee's check unless it's under the Family Medical Leave Act, in which case you can deduct um, as low as an hour from their paycheck for time off without pay if they don't have any time to use. Great. Thanks for that. Um, now, again, last reminder to enter your questions now. I have a two-parter here. And it has to do with uh, salary threshold, beating the salary threshold. So there was an example of the employer who pays an additional $1,000 in, uh, in 2020 to ensure an employer met the 2019 salary threshold. And it, the question is, how does this then impact the, the year-to-date wages for 2020? And there's a part two to that. So I don't know if you want to tackle that first. I guess I have to know, are they talking about they have like a uh, fiscal year that they're using or, I mean, I'm not sure what they're talking about. Uh, it looks like they're just trying to get, we made the extra thousand dollar payment to meet the, uh, probably I would think it's a calendar year in this example to meet the, the 2019 threshold and how is that impacting their the employees' wide year to date wages for 2020? There is no year to date wages for 2020. Um, they bucks. I was going to say, if, it, if it's, you're talking about your thousand bucks short for this year, and you're going to pay him a thousand in January to, for the catch up, like on a highly compensated employee, um, that thousand is attributed to 2019 to, to say that they earned the hundred thousand um, dollars. It doesn't count towards next year's one hundred and seven thousand four hundred thirty two dollars. But it will be reported on next year's IRS statements. Yeah, the part two on that was: Are there recommendations for how to document that these wages were to ensure employee the employee was in compliance for 2019 uh, for the wage wage base of 2019? Recommendations for how to document that the payment well, for. It wouldn't. I guess. It it would depend on the kind of documentation you you use. I mean, I don't know what 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 your what your documentation looks like to know to know how to supplement that to to say it, but it should be documented somewhere. Well, first of all, it won't apply to 2019, so it only starts. You can only use that rule beginning in 2020. Um, but I think. Yeah, I'm with Claudia. However you do your record keeping, there should just be a notation that this is to sal satisfy the prior year's salary basis test. Okay. A um, couple other questions here. Let me see if that this one. Are there any concerns with a licensed insurance sales professional on commission uh, draw that is uh, below a minimum salary threshold but total compensation with commissions at the end of the year exceeds thirty-five thousand. Well, a licensed sales. I'm not sure the person. It depends, I guess, on what they're doing. But I don't know that they're necessarily exempt to start with. Yeah, it depends. Yeah, it depends right. if they do all outside sales. If they're sitting in an insurance sales office for a portion of their work, they're probably not exempt. Okay. Um, this one, it, it alludes to um, a change. Let me read it to you this way. Will, will this change affect employees 
that receive a salary draw that is based on wages that are based on being 100% just commission. Again, um, I'm not, I don't know that these employees are being paid correctly because the only salespeople, unless they qualify for an exemption, but for the most part, salespeople are hourly employees, and except for like the, the outside salespeople, which are basically the door to door salesman kind of people. They spend their entire 40 hours going from business to business trying to sell whatever it is they're selling making a bunch of cold calls, but if you end up sitting at a desk, lining up appointments for you to then go to their business and make a pitch, and then you come back and you put together the presentation or whatever, you're not, you're not exempt. So I'm not sure what it is they're hoping to do with this employee. I mean, you got to be paying them on an hourly basis. So where would you get the salary draw? From the commissions when it's supposed to be they're supposed to be paid hourly well and part of the reason we put both your contact information up on the screen is so that people you know could potentially contact you so if you have these kinds of specific questions i know we covered a lot of material there's a lot of different uh, variables at play um laura and, Di laura and uh, claudia are definitely uh, available if you'd like to follow up with them um you know we encourage you to do that so um, I don't see any other questions in the queue at this point. So I think what we'll do is try to wrap things up. We're, we're past the hour. Um, so let me just kind of plow through some of the closing comments that I have. And one of those is that we always try to um, make sure that we get feedback from our event attendees. And so at the conclusion, we're going to send you pretty quickly after the conclusion a very quick uh, survey. We always take a look at those surveys to try to find out how we did, of course, but also to find out what topics are of interest for you for the future. So we want to make sure um, to encourage you all to please com complete the uh, survey. We are getting our, um, we actually have our first and some of our 2020 webinar series, which I'll tell you about in a moment, but we're also trying to fill out the rest of the year. So your feedback is very important for that. Uh, the next thing I want to mention, um, we are uh, approved for uh, credit hours today through HRCI and SHRM. Um, so please, at the uh, at the end of the conclusion, um, give us a little time. We're going to follow up hopefully tomorrow or no later than Monday to get out the certificates for that credit. Um, and again, I mentioned this too. We we send them out to everybody because we're not exactly sure who no, who needs credit and who doesn't. So if you don't, you could just discard those uh, certificates when they hit your inbox. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is that we have our event page up for this event. We did have a little problem with the slides. Um, so those slides for today were on the web page there. Hopefully you found them during the program. If you didn't, uh, please check it out. The, the uh, slides there plus the chart that Claudia went over are posted. So we uh, want to make sure that you get those and that if you want to uh, pass that information along, have your colleagues go to that event page as well. They can take a look at that information. Um, uh, also, the recording will be there. And then, as I mentioned, we've already got our first installment done uh, and ready to go for our webinar series to continue into 2020. Uh, Laura is going to be back, actually, with Sydney Percelli, who's one of our newer attorneys. And they're going to be talking about the winds of change and, and what the NLRB is up to and how that all impacts employers. So we hope you can join us on January 16th for that. Uh, webinar as well. And uh, Claudia kind of beat me to the punch. She's uh, doing the job of promoting our, our, our blog and our series. So we do have our sophisticated employer blog out there on our website. We encourage you all to check it out. Uh, you can see on the left, there's a little email window. If you, if you put your email address in there, you will receive alerts anytime we update that blog. And I know everybody's uh, waiting for some of those um, updates to come out from the Supreme Court and other areas as well. So we try to uh, be really proactive on getting those uh, communications out through the blog and other channels. So on behalf of Laura and Claudia, that I think wraps it up for the day. Uh, we want to thank all of you for taking time to be with us. We certainly appreciate it. And we want to wish you a, a happy Thanksgiving and a happy holiday season. We won't see, uh, talk to many of you until the new year. So all the best to you and your families. Uh, thanks again for joining us and have a great rest of the day.